Hey there, Vinyl Community. So, I thought today we would uh, try something a little different, something I haven't ever heard anyone um, speak of, you know, in the community, and I'm, and I'm sure people have, but um, just during my, you know, my tenure that I've been around, which hasn't been that long, maybe a, a year and a half or whatever, um, that I haven't, like, heard anyone talk about uh, uh, a music that happened kind of in the 2010s, beginning of the 2010 period, um, a style of music called Vaporwave. And uh, it's kind of electronic music. Um, and uh, Vaporwave was kind of a unique uh, phenomenon. I, I learned about it kind of secondhand by um, um, just uh, being on Bandcamp and checking stuff out and kind of slowly learned about this kind of new electronic music phenomena that was kind of happening and and the whole idea of it is that they're taking um, you know already created music usually um, music from the kind of late 1980s and early 1990s usually uh, very commercial music very AOR sounds and um, and kind of reforming that into something new um, I mean the thing about a lot of these vaporwave artists was, and there's a lot of them, um, was a very much a DIY, uh, DIY, you know, uh, do-it-yourself kind of a aesthetic about it, and um, taking these like very, very commercial, uh, intentionally catchy ear hooks, earworms, um, and turning it into something completely new. And in some ways, it's kind of a a statement. In fact, a lot of what Vaporwave is really all about is um, um, a statement on kind of the commercial, it's uh, a very commercial society that we live in. And uh, probably the most famous album is uh, this one. This is called Floral Shop uh, by Macintosh Plus was the moniker that the uh, uh, artist used. And this is entirely made up of, of music that was taken, um, and, and when you play this, um, if you play this, you will recognize the, I won't even call them samples, because they're more than samples. Um, there's literally, in some cases, taking all the song, the, the, the original song, and slowing it down a little, speeding it up, or, um, manipulating it or mutating it in some ways. And it's very much an intentional challenge to um, the kind of copyright laws that we have in the United States. Um, and you can object to that or not object to that, and I'm sure the artists, these could never be, these are usually gray market releases. Um, and you know, this could never really get, the samples are so obvious, like I said, they're not really samples are so obvious when you listen to it. Um, there's a famous Donna Summer track that's used on this. Um, but having said all of that, there is something to it. I think if, you're, if you keep an open mind about it, you take it for what it is on its own, um, it's not just a you know, kind of critique of, of, uh, of um, of copyright that has kind of gotten out of hand. And there are a lot of people who feel that our copyright laws, especially in the United States, have just gone completely over the top. It's not what they were originally intended to be, which was protect the artists for a period of time um, so that they could make money uh, from the music. Um, you know, now it's become corporatized and those rights have been sold to, in fact, not just sold, but sometimes stolen from the original artists and then um, taken over by corporations who then lobbied Congress to lengthen the period of copyright so that they could continue to make money off of a song that they, they often took advantage of the artist, paid them pennies on the dollar, and went ahead and, um, and made a lot of money from their, from their, from their work. And, and, and Vaporwave is a critique of that. And so, like I said, these could never, you know, you call them uh, gray market releases. Um, most of them originally came out not on vinyl. A vinyl was not the original aesthetic. It was very much a cassette tape. 
And I use the word aesthetic because that's a word that you, keeps cropping up when you, when you talk about um, vaporwave. You'll notice, you know, you look at the cover of this and the, the colors, uh, the design, uh, the you know, kind of um, just over commercialized, you know, uh, you know, uh, catchiness of it in a way. Um, all meant to be a critique on that aesthetic. Where they usually took it from was um, very much from the from the 1980s and early 1990s. That AOR sound. That's usually where they got the the, the tracks that they manipulated. Of course, by now it's grown beyond that, and vaporwave has actually grown into a much bigger. Um, there are, like I said, there are many thousands of artists who work in this field. They still primarily work in the cassette tape area. This is a rare um, uh, uh, vinyl release of this album. And um, it's, Floral Shop is an interesting listen. Um, I think if you give it a chance. A lot of people will just dismiss it out of hand and say, I hear the, the song, they just took the song and they slowed it down. And um, I think if you give it a chance, there is um, some art going on here. And there is an attempt to create something new if done even in a simple way. And um, again, it's just a, an area, and not all Vaporwave took from, um, <coughs> excuse me, took from um, other artists. I mean, a lot of it did, and especially this is famous for, for doing so. But there's another album that I kind of, one that really kind of got me interested. This is called uh, Birth of a New Day. And the name of the, the moniker that's just used is 2814, partially of which is covered up here. But um, again, this is a gray market release, although there is a kind of legitimate label. Now, um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're interested, it can sometimes be had at, at um, Dream Catalog. Um, you can find them on Bandcamp. And uh, this sells out pretty quickly. They do kind of short runs of it. Um, some of them have been better than others. I think I got a pretty good one. Um, I took one that came up about five years ago and it was a pretty good pressing. But some of the pressings have been criticized for being um, you know, not so hot. Um, this music is, uh, how would I describe it? This is completely original. And if you look at the Look at the aesthetic of the sleeve. That tells you a lot about where Vaporwave is kind of coming from. Um, it makes me think of Blade Runner. Um, that kind of uh, late period capitalism, um, corporatization, um, um, a mixing of, of cultures and styles. Um, into something uh, very, very commercial. Um, but this is actually, I think, um, a very, if you like ambient electronic music, and I do, um, this is uh, an interesting recording, and I think well worth hearing. And like I say, this doesn't suffer from the same problem that Coral Shop has, and a lot of other Vaporwave has, in that it did co all come from but it, this was all originally made by two by two um, electronic music producers um, got together and made this. It's a double album set, and um, prices vary depending on whether there's a current it's currently in print or not. I haven't looked in in years, so I don't know whether it's currently in print or not. I've been pretty happy with with mine. This isn't something I listen to every single day, but when I'm in the mood for something. Um, Especially when I'm in the mood for something, making a little bit of a, you know, vaporwave is intentionally subversive. Um, subversive about um, laws that are felt to be um, corporatized to the point of forgetting about us, the consumers or the workers or the producers of art, and uh, only serve. Uh, the masters of uh, the corporate masters who are who are who are conducting the show, um, and it's it's a subversion of that. It's it's forcing Floral Shop and a lot of other vaporwave artists actually hoped 
to be challenged by um, um, uh, the people who own the copyrights. And an interesting note is that nobody has ever tried to challenge their copyright violation if there is a copyright violation. And part of the reason for that is, is they're worried that they would lose in court. And if they lost in court, that means it could open the door to a lot more people being able to say that the, the, the copyright laws have gone far, far beyond what they were originally intended to be. And so the, the, the big corporations have chosen to ignore vaporwave. Um, there have been cease and desist orders issued, but nobody has ever bothered to go to court and to try to take the artist um, to court just because they know that it would be a they know it would be a difficult and expensive case. And so in some ways the subversion that they hope to do has actually uh, has actually been effective. And uh, these are both nice pressings. This one I was really I've never seen it again. It comes with some artwork, kind of a cool poster. You know, these posters are great. I don't I would never, um, I don't know where you'd ever hang them up. <laughs> Maybe someone did, but it's kind of a cool poster. All right, kind of, a, again, taking that artwork, that gaudy, you know, 80s, you know, th those colors, um, and uh, just exploding it. Um, and then, of course, the, the vinyl itself was on a, a nice um, pink vinyl. And... Uh, and it's on this one, this particular pressing, which is said to be on, I don't even think a, a label was cited on this. Although it says that this issue came out in 2016. Um, although this was originally released in 2011. And like I said, original copies, the cassette copies that are the original, actually go for, for quite a bit of money if you can find the originals, which are really, really hard to find. I uh, never never pursued any of that, and I was happy when I stumbled upon this one day in one of my local shops. They had it brand new, and it was just, uh, the guy said, he goes, if you want it, grab it, because I don't think we'll ever get it again. And uh, so I was kind of happy to grab that. Um, I'm sure if you do some hunting around, you know how it is. If you really want it, you can always, um, you can always find it. But I just wanted to talk about it a little bit. I haven't heard anyone make a video about Vaporwave. Um, I know, like I said, I'm sure they're out there, but I thought, I think it's an interesting, I think it's interesting in a lot of ways. The, the music is interesting. And, uh, you know, that's primarily, you know, why you're going to, you know, buy a record or whatever. But I also think that there's, I like the, um, the subversiveness of what they're trying to do. And, um, and, and that adds to it. And I also, the aesthetic of it, this, um, this kind of um, mocking or um, exploiting a particularly commercial period of, you know, AOR sounds. And I won't mention any particular artist, but you can think of like the music that was on the radio during that period, you know, the, the, the really overtly candy-coated, you know, uh, radio hits that, um, that were popular from say 88 or 86 to the early 90s and that was really kind of the original the original aesthetic of it um, anyway like I said I just thought it was something interesting you might find it interesting if you do um, these are kind of fun you can you can listen to them um, just for uh, you know for shits and giggles if you want on YouTube both of these albums can be found and listened to that's probably the best way to give them a sample um, and uh, maybe it's not something you need to have in your collection, but I enjoy having them, and I wouldn't say they go on my on my turntable, uh, you know, that often. But it's it's fun when when uh, I get a chance to. And and this one, Birth of a New Day, I actually um, recommend for the music if you like um, kind of an alternative soundtrack to um, to Blade Runner. Think of it that way. Thanks and. Uh, Hope everyone had a good Sunday, and uh, we'll uh, we'll talk to you later. Thanks.